We're digging deep and asking the questions we need to ask. Years of stress and not just emotional. I was depleting my body. I was malnourished. I'm working out like crazy. I'm eating all these healthy foods. How could I not be well? We have to get back to the basics. We can change the way our genes are expressed. Anyone that wants to improve their health or upgrade their health, they should be biohacking. My name is Renee. And I'm Lauren. We are the Biohacker Babes. We're sisters and we're joining forces to empower you to become your own biohacker and upgrade your life. The Biohacker Babes podcast aims to create insight into the body's natural healing abilities, strengthen your intuition, and empower you with techniques and modalities to optimize your health and wellness. Because life is too short to not feel your best every single day. This podcast offers health, fitness, and nutritional information and is designed for educational purposes only. You should not rely on this information as a substitute for, nor does it replace professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. If you have any concerns or questions about your health, you should always consult with a physician or other healthcare professional. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the show. Welcome to episode 25 of the Biohacker Babes. I am Lauren. I'm here with my sister Renee and our very special guest today, Dr. Sam Shea. Dr. Shea is a functional medicine doctor, a chiropractor, and acupuncturist in Boulder, Colorado, our, one of our very favorite cities. Uh, Dr. Shea and I met this year at Burning Man which is quite interesting. I went to talk uh, that you were giving at Heebie-Jeebie Healers Camp about biohacking your genetics. I was like reading through the the list of activities, everything, you know, wild and crazy from whiskey and pickle shots to, you know, making different decorations for like, excuse my language, but like titty tassels. That's what happens at Burning Man. It's like quite a spectrum. (laughs) I saw a a talk for biohacking and of course I had to go and hear you. And I I really enjoyed those few hours that I spent there. I was really drawn to your energy and your approach. I love that you really stress minimal input to maximize output. And that's sort of what we're all about here as biohackers, like making our lives easier for like a, a greater return, right? So um, welcome, Dr. Shea. I'm just going to give you a quick bio, and then I'll let you sort of lead the way, Dr. Shea. Great. So Dr. Sam Shea, he helps biohackers, entrepreneurs, and mompreneurs who have behavioral and food addictions to increase their energy, resilience, and creativity so they can create and sustain a great business to create more personal freedom. Dr. Shea walked his own health journey from being chronically unwell from age 6 to 18 and overcoming sugar and video game addiction. He dedicated his life to natural medicine, get himself and others well, which led him to functional medicine and functional testing. Dr. Shea helps his clients with custom nutrition and lifestyle plans with his 10 pillars of health framework, the tame the beast of addiction framework, health coaching, and functional testing. Amazing. Welcome, Dr. Shea. Thank you. Thank you both. You're welcome. Uh, uh, for, for context, uh, I've been to Burning Man, it's been, been my sixth time and my, awesome. uh, I go, I, I personally go to Burning Man for kind of transformation. Like I go to really build up a great community, uh, and teach, uh, all sorts of stuff like biohacking in different forms. It's biohacking genetics, biohacking, or biohacking, biohacking addictions, looking at all sorts of different angles of how to help people, but also just, I find that if people want some context, they can go look up what's called the temple at Burning Man. And Mm -hmm. the temple to me is one of the most like precious spots on the universe. And it's a place where all of human tragedy and human suffering all goes and is left there to be burned up uh, for people to let go. So you walk into this beautiful temple that's built and burned every year and there's pens everywhere and people write everything they want to burn away. Sorrow, grief, anger, regrets. There's piles of diaries, piles of wedding dresses from divorces. There's a memorabilia. There's pictures, there's photos, there's letters. There's everything you can imagine is all left in the temple and you can walk through and just see the collective the collective commonality of human suffering and the intention of the temple is to go and leave your suffering behind. And the very last full day of the burn, 
on Sunday night, the entire Burning Man community sits around in silence and watches this, this temple burns like a, a pyre uh, offered up into the heavens, burning away all everyone's, just, just every, everyone's troubles. And it's, it's one of the few group rituals on that scale. Uh, and I just, I have so many profound insights just reading, reading what, what people have written and then go and face my own blank canvas uh, on a portion of the temple walls and process out what it is that I need to let go of uh, for the upcoming year. So a lot of people who are considering Burning Man uh, be, be very wary of what is public about like, you know, it's, oh, it's just this, this, and this, and they, they think it's just a big party. And that's not, it's, that's really not always the case. Yeah. At the um, root, for sure. At the root of it. Yeah. So what on going back to biohacking, my approach with biohacking is to give the 30,000 foot view. And the approach came from clinical experience. It's not from some armchair, you know, some, some armchair health enthusiast who read the, the latest, you know, five, 10 books and have been keeping up to date on po- some podcasts. It's, it's not like that. When you're actually working with people who are really, really sick, as well as people who just want to maintain their health and not go backwards, as well as the aspirational biohacker entrepreneur types who want to achieve excellence in high performance or creativity or maximize their recovery or a quote, stop the clock program or, or whatever it is they're wanting to do. The way you know you have a framework, a, an actual 30,000 foot view on a subject is that if you can take your framework and apply it across multiple different peoples in terms of what their goals are. So to be more specific, when I was working with chronically unwell people, uh, my first practice in New Zealand was like people with fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, autoimmune issues, hormone issues, gut issues, a lot of them all at the same time or some combination. I found that there were 10 different parts of people's health, 10 different pillars of health, if you will. And what I found is that people who were chronically unwell, who were bouncing from one product or to one practitioner or to one protocol to the next and not getting the results they wanted in a sustained, meaningful, and life-changing way, is that these people had a minimum seven out of 10 pillars crumbling. When we look at that, suddenly we can explain why is it that people who are suffering don't get better when they just chase after product practitioner or protocol, because most of those product practitioner protocols are good at one, two, three pillars, not seven plus. Mm -hmm. And what's needed is a synergistic wide angle approach where you can look at all 10 pillars and then more importantly, prioritize, figure out and prioritize what pillars need, what pillars have been crumbling over time and what pillars have been sledgehammered. And there's four of the 10 pillars that can be sledgehammered. And then figure out a synergistic program where you work on all the pillars in a meaningful, winnable way, where you give the smallest amount of inputs to get the maximal outputs without overwhelming the person who's trying to get better. So when I looked at those, those 10 pillars, I then also realized that 10 pillars also apply to those that wish to maintain. So for example, someone's in a midlife crisis or a quarter life crisis or whatever crisis you may be. And you know it's going to be a rough year or two years or three years or whatever. And there's not a realistic expectation that you can become this mega, super biohacky, entrepreneur high performer that's glowing and everything, all this <laughs> wonderful stuff. It's, it's not realistic given because people have life circumstances, family circumstances, moving uh, sickness and you know, one's children or one's parents or whatever it is. The same 10 pillars apply to those that want to maintain their health and not slip backwards despite a, a, an upcoming known stressful quantity that's going to interfere with your health progress. So you can at least maintain. So you look at the same 10 pillars and do the exact same thing, prioritize them and figure out what is the smallest number of inputs to create the synergistic effect to benefit all the pillars that need help all at once. And then you go to the aspirational biohacker entrepreneur side of the spectrum. These are not people who are kind of meh, they're not the people who are unwell. Like they're not trying to get out of pain. They're not trying to just to maintain where they're at. They're actually trying to get better and better and better, better, better. Same 10 pillars apply, exact same, exact same process. 
to look at 10 pillars, you find out which ones are the most important to look at. So I'll give you an example, uh, if it, and, and I'll cover the 10 pillars shortly, but just to kind sure. of still keep it as a 30,000 foot view. Mm -hmm. the, the, the big mistakes that I find in bio, with biohackers is that they get really, they get confused the tactic for the strategy. They think the latest goji berry juice, you squirt up your nose, is somehow going to be the most amazing nootropic to shift your <laughs> ketones or whatever. Like, yeah, I've heard not, that before. <laughs> yeah. Well, tell yeah. me more of this magic goji juice you squirt up your It'll nose. It'll solve all of my problems. <laughs> right, exactly. uh, so what, th they're confusing the tactic for the strategy. So using nutrition is a tactic. Biohacking is a strategy. It's not the latest supplement it's not the latest coconut oil extract it's not the most magic set of orange tinted glasses it's not you know submerging yourself in ice water it's it's not you know tracking your sleep it's not dimming changing all the light bulbs to led red and red or orange optional bulbs it's it's none of that that's not biohacking those are tactics within biohacking Biohacking mm -hmm. is a systemic way of thinking to identify the highest priority pillars of health and implement the smallest and easiest lifestyle changes that will give the greatest results in a meaningful, sustainable way. I love that. Wow. Biohacking is not yeah. a trick. It's not a magic bullet. It's not a product. It's not a supplement. They, these are tactics within biohacking, not biohacking itself. So, for example, the, the biggest mistakes I see with biohackers is that they're like, they usually like just bite onto like three, one to three pillars. They just grab onto that, like diet or exercise or sleep, whatever it is. They just, they're just like bulldog it, you know, and they are really, really wanting to get to hundred percent maximal efficiency and perfection in those three pillars. So the problem is the problem of diminishing returns. So when I look at someone in 10 pillars model and I see like their, their diet is like 98% dialed in based on their, their lifestyle, their health goals, they ran their genetics, you know, they measure all their labs every year, sometimes twice a year, they've got all these different things and they're trying to get that last 2%, but what they have, so like they're trying to get that last 2%. But what they didn't realize is that they've ignored this example, like their exercise is at 20%. Hmm. And so the amount of time, the amount of effort going to get from 98% to 99% is the exact same amount of effort to go from 20% to 80% of the hmm. other pillar. Then that's, that's biohacking. It's stepping back and letting go of your precious obsession in the current biohacking universe and stepping back and looking at, okay, what, what pillars are crumbling that need more attention? Because I'm getting diminishing returns with the ones I'm super good at. You're still getting returns. They're just diminishing. So that's, that's the overview is to look at the 10 and understand the 10 pillars. I'm going to share what the 10 pillars are in a minute. But people get lost. They get become fanatical. And it also, on, on the precious one to three pillars or whatever, and it explains also this phenomenon that is so frustrating to people who like me and like, you know, the clients that I've worked with and still work with, the like, oh, you're feeling bad? Try this thing. Try this one thing. It worked for me before. The, the narrative is the same. It's identical. Okay, ready? Here's the narrative. Just insert your product of choice. It doesn't yeah. matter, right? Yeah. I felt like this. And no one believed me. And then I tried this, 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 and this, and this, and it wasn't working until I found this. And then everything changed and my whole life is better. And oh my God, did you know that they didn't want you to know about it? They have been suppressing yeah. this forever. And it's all a conspiracy to hide, <laughs> keep you down. <laughs> From the, you know, yes. by the way, I have for sale. You can be my MLM downline. You know, yeah. so it's this, oh yeah, I have heard that many, many times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it just <laughs> creates more of a divide, which is the opposite of what we're trying to do here. Yeah. Well, here's here's how the model can actually explain why I can believe they had a genuine experience of why they got radically better with their precious insert product here. Okay, because for those people, 
they had nine out of 10 pillars that were about 70%. And then they had this other pillar that was a 30. And then this product protocol, whatever it is, it's ice baths, it could be snorting goji berry, just doesn't matter. They find the thing and that thing happened to be what that pillar at 30% needed to bring them up to 70. And suddenly they feel so much better. So that becomes, yeah. 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 So for them, like their fanaticism, pardon me, enthusiasm, pardon me, their enthusiasm for the product is legit and explainable by the 10 pillar model. And it also Mm. explains why their precious products didn't work for someone who's chronically unwell. Because if you've got, let's flip it, nine pillars at 30% and one at 70, and let's say you give them the magic goji juice and it brings one pillar from 30 to 70. That's great. And you got eight other pillars to deal with. That's why they don't feel the meaningful changes. So what we, the 10 pillar model, what it will give everyone listening is it will contextualize every single thing you have ever learned about health and every single thing you will ever learn about health. You can put all of them into their respective pillars and you will see balance. You will understand where everything fits. And when you see someone just going super fanatical on, you know, sticking their head under six pounds of ice water or whatever it is, and you see, okay, that actually makes sense in this pillar or two. Okay. And you can see why it works. And you don't, and you can go and do those things, but not to the exclusion of analyzing all your other pillars to make sure you're not becoming fanatical in this one direction. I'm all for ice bath therapy and all these other things and good nutrients. It's about understanding where you personally, individually are at so you actually don't get lost in diminishing returns. You actually focus on the pillars that matter to you the most. Absolutely. So I just want to jump in and ask you a few questions Mm -hmm. before you go through the pillars. We're familiar with them, but I would love for you to go through them with Mm -hmm. the audience. So it sounds like the 10 pillars create, they're they're puzzle pieces, right? Mm -hmm. And if we're missing a puzzle piece, we don't have the overall picture of health. Can you explain to us why some people would be missing a few pillars or maybe just not be aware of them? Like what draws people to the fanaticism? Is it fear? Is it just ignorance? Is it the attachments? Like which ones are commonly ignored? And then wh- sure. why do you think that is? So the, 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 it's really that people aren't fully aware of the significance of, of all the pillars as equal combatants on the, the playing field of health. Sure. And um, that's, it really comes down to people's biases, not, not necessarily, biases is not really the right word. I mean, it can be with certain people, but you know, people learn about what they learn about and they don't learn about what they don't learn about. And so when you, you see this in the functional medicine world, you know, you've got people say, that's all about adrenal glands. Like I've written an ebook on, on adrenal glands. Okay. So mm-hmm. I'm, I understand <laughs> that. All right. And, but it, the, the universe is not, the universe is not revolve, revolve around adrenal glands. It does for a lot of people, like a whole bunch. And so you can create this idea for yourself that it's, it's adrenal glands are bust because once you succeed with a whole kind of critical mass of people, those critical mass of people usually refer similar people to you. So it becomes a self-licking ice cream cone of all you see is adrenals and then everyone else out there who's also doing some other type of health intervention um, they're, first off, you see all of their broken patients that what their special is, let's say the other person was specializing in, uh, whatever, like gut health or whatever. And like, you see all the people from the, that failed in that gut health practice and they come to you and you help them. So I think, Oh, get, oh it just really is all about dreams because clearly gut health didn't work over there. But what you don't, but what but happens to these people is they don't fully realize that the people that they don't help with their adrenal program and leave the practice those people almost never report back that they went and succeeded over there with the gut health person. Mm-hmm. So mm. it becomes this, this self-fulfilling prophecy of it's all about this one thing. And, and that, that doesn't have to be a clinician. It could be a person say like, look, uh, once I dialed in my sleep, like everything was better. And that's probably true. Yeah. And, yeah. but again, it's like magic bullet therapy. They, they're just chasing after this one thing. It's the one true health technique or whatever. So the, the, the background of the 10 pillars actually came from the chiropractic triangle of health, which was developed in 1895 by the founder of chiropractic, D.D. Palmer. Back then, 1895, things were a lot simpler. Uh, 90% of people were farmers. 
everyone lived near their families unless they had moved, they'd moved west, you know, to, or usually brought their families with them. The Edison hadn't yet fully popularized the light bulb. So people like went to, went to bed when it was, you know, dark. And there already three major factors, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. And all the food was organic by default, unless you were near like a coal mine and something super overt. The main things that were killing people were infection, usually from pooping and peeing in their own water, or they caught sepsis from an injury, like when they were hunting or farming and they got cut or whatever. Uh, it was, it was death by infection. It was death by exposure, uh, from the elements. It was death by starvation and it was death death by trauma. So like you, if you're hunting things with hooves, teeth, and horns with a stick, it's risky. You know, back then they had, uh, you know, they did have rifles, but you know, herds of Buffalo, they get, you know, they can trample you. So, and there's like wolves and there's the, 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 the United States wasn't, you know, quote tamed yet at that point. So the things that, that carried people off, those have, those aren't the things that are carrying off people today. Infection, exposure, starvation, and trauma, you know, all, a lot, modern modernity has solved a lot of that. Most people didn't, re- most people died in the great depression, not from starvation, but from exposure. Hmm. Oh, that's, yeah. that's how people mostly died. You know, the rule of threes, you know, three hours, if you're out hiking, it's, you have three hours to live. If you're not warm, like, like if you're, it's really cold. Mm-hmm. You have three yeah. days to live without water and you have 30 days without food, or three weeks without food, rather. Right. So exposure yeah. will kill you faster than First. any of them. Okay. Yeah. So back then, the triangle of health, physical, chemical, emotional, trauma, toxins, and thoughts. That model in 1895 for health was pretty brilliant because there wasn't a lot of complexity back then, you know, the, the really yeah. the, compared to now. Now, you know, 124 years later, uh, things are more complicated. So what I did is I took in, when I was in chiropractic school, I really got super nerdy on neurology and was taking like postgraduate neurology seminars on the, on the weekends and as long with nutrition seminars and physiology seminars and, and all sorts of other stuff. And I put the brain in the middle of that triangle. So, cause the physical inputs, chemical inputs, and emotional inputs all converge in the brain to create the outputs of are you in a stress response or not? How are you responding to as your, as your physiology doing? If you want to pick a center of the brain in terms of where those three converge, it'd be the hypothalamus for the nerd geeks out there and or scrabble right. enthusiasts, hypothalamus, great, like 26 letters or points or whatever on the board. Yes. <laughs> um, the, you've got those three, imp- you got all those converge on the brain. But what I saw also was that even saying, we're going to work on your your physical, your chemical, and your emotional self along with your brain. Like it's not specific enough. So what I did is I split each corner of the triangle into three parts. So the physical triangle, physical corner was split into bowel and digestion. So you, you, do you chew? Do you poo? Are you absorbing your nutrients? How's your bowel function? That's, that's, one, of the, that's, that's one of the pillars is bowel and digestion. The other physical pillar is the physical body. So this is working on untreated injuries, spinal misalignments, bad dental work. The body also includes genetics, your genetics. So you can body genetics, old injuries is the third pillar. And old injuries are meaningful because if you have old injuries and you create an inflammatory windup in the misaligned joints that, that have been injured and have been fully corrected. You also create a stress response in the joints because movement neurology coming from the joint movement of your extremities and most especially your spine feeds the frontal lobes. Everyone here who's into biohacking is like, I want my brain to be totally bright and shiny. Okay. Then you need to get your spine adjusted by a trained professional. Full stop. Yeah. No Address argument. the old shit. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. Get, get your spine adjusted. Make sure that your your old injuries are cared for and treated properly. Because if you don't, you're going to be in a chronic inflammatory windup that's, that's additive and cumulative. And you're also going to be in a stress neurology windup, which is additive and cumulative. Mm-hmm. So that's the third pillar, body, old injuries, genetics. And the, the, the whole separate talk we can have about how to assess genetics from a biohacking standpoint, but it briefly it's you look at the 10 pillars of health to understand your lifestyle which influences 
the expression of your genes. But then there's certain ways to analyze genetics. Like I'm one of the few people in the States that do uh, fit genes analysis. So if people have had a 23andMe or an Ancestry.com, I can take the data and convert it into a systems biology approach where you actually look at the top 15 genes that look at inflammation and, and you don't look for one gene that's got a variant and go, oh my God, I have MTHFR for methylation. I'm screwed. No, you don't do that. What you do is you look at the clusters. There's like 15 genes for inflammation and you look for, do you have, you know, 13 of those genes have negative variants like I do. And so you look at the pattern of the process. So if I've got 13 out of the 15 inflammatory genes of negative variants, then I go into the software and figure out what's the fewest number of lifestyle interventions that beneficially change the negative variant expression. So I don't have to do 13 separate lifestyle interventions. I do three that catch all 13 of them. So when you do your, the biggest problem with people with their genetics is they get this massive report. It's overwhelming. It's not prioritized. They don't understand what to do. They're frustrated and scared and overwhelmed. What I yeah, do- We all want simplicity. Exactly. And just for context, our, our audience is very familiar with the basic genetic testing, like okay, 23andMe, DNA Fit, Found My Fitness, like funneling that data through other things, but Fit Genes is new. So definitely go into that and maybe explain how people can get access to Sure, that. sure. So Fit Genes, what, it's, what it is, it, let me, um, Fit Genes was, was developed by Dr. Paul Beaver. I have on my website, uh, drsamshay.com, uh, at drsamshay.com, I have an interview with Dr. Paul Beaver, who is the chief science officer of Fit Genes. I've lectured at the Fit Genes conferences, and he's the founder. And what happened? He's actually a PhD engineer, not a doctor, not a medical doctor, which is to his credit, it's to his favor. And I'll tell you why: because super high end, super advanced, super intelligent engineers like Dr. Beaver, what does an engineer do? They take a process that's overwhelming and confusing, and according to data arrange it in an order that is reliable and predictable to get reliable and predictable results every time. And so he did that with genetics. So what he did, this is oh. so brilliant. It, and the reason why he got involved with this, and he talks about this on the podcast I did with him, is that both of his parents got, were diagnosed with cancer in the same month. And that's when he said, oh. I need to focus on genetics like now, like right now. So he's read thousands upon thousands of papers. Like it is insane the amount of papers he's read. So what he did is that he figured out there were seven drivers of disease, inflammation, free radical damage, liver detoxification capacity, vitamin D utilization, methylation, cardiovascular circulation, fat and energy. Those are the seven. All right. Then those are prioritized. Guess what's on top? And inflammation controls methylation. People who are freaking out over their MTHFR need to take a breath, stand back, you know, chant ohm, whatever you need to do to calm down and look at what's upstream from methylation and it's inflammation. Also the free mm -hmm. radical, also vitamin D utilization, the VDR genes, et cetera, et cetera. So he, rather than running out and getting a methylated supplement, which is exactly. a quick fix, and exactly. it doesn't work. It's, yeah. it's, it can work yeah. for some people. Uh, the, but it, the, the reality is, is that that's not actually that's treating that that's a medical mindset that's using a natural product as a pharmaceutical you're using you're using a supplement like a pharmaceutical as right. opposed to actually looking at the, the big, big picture. picture of natural a natural approach and natural doesn't people are confusing natural with oh it's just organic you know b vitamins you know instead of taking this concentrated you know pharmaceutical thing that's a pharmaceutical right. approach to a natural intervention Yes. That, and, and what we're trying to talk about here is biohacking as looking at what is lifestyle truly sy systematically. What does that mean? The 10 pillars and the 10 pillars affects your genes, like the inflammatory genes and all the rest of it. So just jogging back to the, what Dr. Beaver did is he had this, he identified the seven drivers of disease. Okay. So then first he had four criteria for the genes he picked out of all the genes. Okay. Four criteria. Number one, did these genes strongly influence one of those seven drivers? Criteria number two, of those genes, which of those genes were upstream in the control of those seven drivers? So you want the few the genes on the top that control the hundreds and thousands of genes underneath it. So you're actually influencing things in a scalable um, logarithmic way. Second, third, so wait, backing up, seven drivers, 
upstream genes that control the seven drivers. Third criteria, which of those genes had at least 10% variation within the population? So you're actually testing for meaningful genes that are likely to show up as a variant, not something that's point zero 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 one percent has a negative variant on it. Okay, so if I'm going to be testing you for genes, I want to test for genes that are very likely to show up as a negative variant in the population. So he picked over 10%. And so that was the cutoff. Then the fourth criteria, perhaps most important, is that all of the genes must have peer-reviewed scientific research done in top journals done on humans, not mice, not guinea pigs, not, you know, you know, Jeff the Roach. It's not, it's not, it's done on humans to show that lifestyle and nutrition alone, not pharmaceuticals, lifestyle and nutrition alone can shift the expression of these genes in a beneficial way. So those are the four criteria. Now, guess how many genes out of all of them he came down with in terms of fulfilling all four of those criteria? Seven drivers upstream, at least 10%, showed peer-reviewed scientific research done on humans, a lifestyle alone, nutrition alone can shift them. How many? I'm saying you can count them on two hands. Yeah, I wouldn't think very many. 64. Oh, that's actually higher than I thought. Okay. It, it used to be 58, but he's added six more recently, like huh. this month. Now he's added six more. Wow, so, that's great. I didn't know there was that much research that could prove that. Uh, it, it, what, yeah. there's, there's his, I've, been, I've been to the lab in Melbourne, and I've, I've had many conversations with Dr. Bieber, and like, there's some, there's some pretty sexy software out there that collates all the research like <laughs> we hey, love um, sexy tech yeah, yeah. There's, there's <laughs> if it's leading tech. to the right conversation we yeah, love it <laughs> like he like he showed me he showed me some of the software i'm like bro you've been holding out on me <laughs> like the yeah. software is amazing share the wealth <laughs> yeah. so um so those, so what happens is that now you've got these 64 genes that are like the super highest part. And, th- and then he organizes them by order of priority themselves. So like, so you've got the 64 genes, but even those are prioritized because the 15 inflammatory are on top. Then it's the three free radical genes, you know, MN SOD, mm. GPX1, CAT. Then you've got eight um, liver detox genes. And then you've got the two VDR genes. And then you've got methylation and so on and so forth. So even those are prioritized. And so what, what happens is that I take, I take his data I take, well, people send, if they have 23 mean ancestry, or if they can do a fresh swab, they can send the, the cheek swab over to Australia. However it works, whatever, you send the data, however they get the data, it's then converted into this layout. And then what I do is then I take that layout and I analyze, all right, of the genes, are these genes in clusters? Uh, do I see a cluster pattern? And then from there, I look at what are the fewest number of lifestyle interventions? that influence the highest priority clustered genes. And so, and I prioritize, like, so like I send people a list of here are the, it's color coded, like green is like, you start with these few things first. And once you've done all of those, then you do these and then these. And I say, here's why. And I can literally point to, these are the number of genes that are going to be influenced, the highest number of priority genes for your particular situation. This is why you do these things. And you don't bother to go to the next ones because you can see, according to the data, you get diminishing returns. All right. There's a flow mm. chart. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so they get like, here's your list of things to do. And it's totally prioritized. And all the research is there. Every, every single intervention has a paper behind it. And it's like, and they're like, oh, finally, genetics that makes sense. Yeah. Oh well, God. understanding yeah. the why is so powerful because a list is just a list if you can't Absolutely. understand yeah. it. I was going to say, I, I like the idea of prioritizing because we know when our patients or clients start to feel better, they're then more motivated to make more changes. So I love the idea of make these three simple changes, get the biggest bang for your buck, start feeling better, and then work on the other things. I, I think that's brilliant. I love yeah. that. Can you just give the audience like some examples of some of the lifestyle interventions? Like are these habits? Are they like checklist items? So here's, I'll I'll give you some examples. All right. So I I presented um, at one of the Fit Genes conferences on dealing with um, inflammatory, the difference between caloric weight gain and inflammatory weight gain. So I had two Mm -hmm. patients in New Zealand that were large men and the more they exercise, the fatter they got. And the more in pain they were in their joints, and also they both had man boobs. Now, I'm not like I don't have like some sort of weird fascination with man boobs. It's a clinical observation. So when I saw 
like, huh, the more they exercise, the fatter they got, the more pain they got, and they also had man boobs. Hmm. That sounds like they are triggering an inflammatory spiral, and that's hence the, the water weight from inflammatory weight gain, the more pain in their joints, and they probably have issues in their genes with estrogen detox, and they probably have exposure to xenoestrogens or outside estrogens that they can't metabolize. So what happens when you put on a lot of weight quickly and you have a hormone in your body that redistributes the fat to your pecs? Man boobs. That's mm-hmm. what that is. Okay. Yeah. So then I ran their genetics. And I did two genetics tests on them. I did at that point it was a 58 gene test, not the 64 health and well-being panel that it is as of this month. I also ran a carb choice test, which is a, a special genetic test that's only done out of fit genes, which, which determines your optimal carb tolerance. Tolerance. Are, right. are you are you a paleo? <laughs> are you a keto? Are you a Mediterranean? Are you a high carb? And yes, for all you paleo enthusiasts and keto nerds out there, there are high carb people on the universe. Sorry, yes. the universe, the <laughs> precious keto bubble. They do exist. They were they're real. Okay, yes, a lot of leprechauns and Bigfoot. Okay, and, and unicorns. Okay, so they you can genetically test for your carb tolerance. So I tested them for all of that. Now they both had low carb tolerance, but uh, what I did is that I looked at their genes. Specific, I looked at the the fifty eight gene test because there was some, there was another person I could compare them to that also had low carb tolerance but wasn't putting on inflammatory weight gain, right? And I compared all of their genes together. And what I found was that their genes, these two gentlemen, their calorie burning genes, the ones that burn calories for energy and heat, you know, whether it's the uncoupling genes or the ADR beta genes or whatever, uh, if you want to get any genetics nerds out there, those are the ones that convert fat to energy, fat to heat. Their calorie burning genes were like perfect. They were, they were amazing calorie burners. But what was really out of whack was their inflammatory genes. Most importantly, their anti-inflammatory genes are interleukin-10. So there's three interleukin-10 uh, genes that are tested in, in fit genes. Uh, so they couldn't, they, they over-initiated. This is your interleukin-1s, interleukin-6s, um, you know, TNF-alphas, and so on. They over-propag- it can overpropagate, which is the... Uh, this, the Cox genes or the CRP genes, or they undercleared inflammation, which is the interleukin tens. Additionally, they had uh, red dots in their uh, bad variants in their GSTP1 gene, which is the main one that deals with estrogen metabolism. I think there was also a phase one gene. I, I can't see why he did. I can't. I have to look it up. I can't remember at this moment. They also had an NAD, uh, NADCYA beta, I believe, gene. And that was also a gene that was very strongly linked to metabolic syndrome. So what you, and they also, both VDR genes were red as well. So I'm so impressed. You could just like rattle off these snips. It's really amazing. So just for, for, to bring it down to, you know, plebe speak, it's basically they were over inflaming. Most importantly, they couldn't clear the inflammation. That's really important. Uh, you, if if you have a little coal fire, but you can't put it out, it's going to create a problem eventually. And interesting because those people are just probably beating their heads against the wall and blaming like poor metabolism, but they don't even really understand what that process means. Yeah, yeah. So the information is powerful. So what what I did with them is that I put them on an anti-inflammatory diet, anti-inflammatory supplements. I identified all the exogenous sources of estrogen, which were a lot. Microwave plastics, soy products, inorganic hormone-fed chicken, Mm. Uh, making sure that their their significant intimate partners had uh, their their makeups and their body lotions were organic and weren't full of these weird estrogens that uh, that's why they fill out the wrinkles because they're adding estrogens which propagate skin growth which is really nice for aesthetics but it's really scary when it comes to your metabolism and your physiology. Uh, I looked at uh, were they the dirty dozen uh, from the environmental working group. I said if people want to cut down their their toxic exposure from produce items. By 80%, again, round numbers, easy to remember, 80-20 rule. It's not, is it, is it 80%? I don't know. It doesn't matter. It works. The, <laughs> the, the environmental working group, ewg.org, the dirty dozen. I said, you, these 12 vegetables must be organic or spray-free. There is no, no negotiate, negotiation on this. this. This is non-negotiable. Okay. Just check it off the list. Yes. Exactly. What do you I, say about meat? Is, is non-organic meat non-negotiable? It depends on the country. 
It depends oh. on the country. So, so in New Zealand, um, uh, basically all the beef and sheep are pasture fed. Like, it's just the way That's it is. That's just what it is. What it is. Right, you know? yeah. Um, so it depends on the country. Uh, like mm. wild, like venison, like venison in New Zealand, like they're, the deer are freaking pests, man. Like, like they are, the four biggest pests in New Zealand are wild boar, deer, possum, and rabbit, all edible and all that. And this is, this is a hilarious conversation I have with people who are vegan in New Zealand for environmental reasons. Like, oh, if you're an environmentalist, then you should go get a gun and shoot and eat as many deer, boar, pig, possum, and rabbit as possible. If you know, if you truly care about the forests of New Zealand and they're right. like sitting there, yeah. like, like going into the catatonic trance. Because they're, they're <laughs> How out. dare you? you know? But it's true. Like, like they can't, they're having right. this cognitive dissonance in their brain. And, and it's just a reality. Uh, like we can have a whole talk on diet. Like I have a whole, t- I, we can have a whole thing on that later. Yeah. I wrote, I have a public talk I gave once uh, uh, several times called uh, uh, Ending the Food War, Finding Peace and Common Ground Between Paleos and Vegans. And, and, and the summary is effectively like paleo, the people who eat meat and the people who are vegans, we, we agree on 95% of everything. Local, clean, organic, seasonal, you know, you know sustainable, you know, low, low carbon footprint, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's just people argue over this last 5%. Mm-hmm. And, and just, just to cut to the chase. And, I, and I'm, I give this lecture to a group, like this is in the Illuminate Festival in New Zealand, you know, like 3,000 people. And there's some like hardcore vegans. I'm not talking like the weekend wannabes. I'm talking like full on live in the woods, you know, hardcore vegans from Golden Bay, you know, coming to this festival. Wow. And I'm the, the, the pre- person who runs the event, you know, she's like, Dr. Shea, you got, you you go give the talk on nutrition, you know, two hours, it's all yours. You know, so I have this tent of 400 people and two hours to talk on nutrition. That's how many people are vegan, like half the room raise wow. their hands, you know? And so I'm there to like, tell, tell them straight about what's going on. And at, just to, at the end of the talk, I said, look, we're all fighting against each other. And that's not the goodest support of our energies. Here's the deal. Okay. Ready? This is the agreement. You can sign on a dotted line out there. If you want people eat meat, you have to deal with the true horrors of the industry, b- b- big, big, uh, factory farming, factory farming meat like that. Yeah. That's got to go. Okay. That's your responsibility. The vegans, you got to deal with GMO. Okay. That's your responsibility deal. Mm-hmm. And everyone's like deal, deal, you know, so that's deal. the deal. That way we it's stop fighting fair. with each other. Yeah. We, we, so with, um, Ge- oh, going back to genes and then 10 pills. We'll get there. I promise. We'll get to the 10 pillars. Right. <laughs> so with, with the genes, so with the genes, when you've got all the, so going back to examples. So we've got these two gentlemen. Okay. So I put them on, I identified all the sources of exogenous estrogen and removed them from their diet. Okay. I put them on an anti-inflammatory diet. So I removed all the the, the sugar, everything that's inflammatory. Just, they can just look this up. What is inflammatory? And they can look it up. All nightshades. Mm-hmm. Uh, all sugars, all processed food, all takeout food. Um, they, they've really got to cut down on, uh, it's not just sugar, like they cut down on most grains for them as grains for, especially for people who have low carb tolerance like they did, that's wicked inflammatory. Yeah. The other thing I did is I put them on a lifestyle. It's like, okay, stop doing exercise. You need to start doing movement. Mm-hmm. Different. Oh, walk. that freaks people out, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The walk more, do saunas, sweat. Just do movement, do sweat, get get massages, saunas, and walk. Okay. Yeah. And you Intelligent can, this, you movement. Can, yeah. You can also do like the ice packs on the on the thoracic spine that you read about in Tim Ferriss's book or whatever you want. Like you you can do all of those other things like cold therapy and all the rest to drop whatever drops inflammation, you go for it. I also put them on anti-inflammatory supplements that were based on their genetics. So that's not, there's a difference between nutritional dosing and nutrigenomic dosing. That's really important. Nutrigenomic dosing is totally different than nutritional dosing. So nutritional dosing of say fish oil, here's your one gram of fish oil. Okay. That's great. It's just widgets in the existing machinery of the cells, right? You give someone four grams of fish oil, you change the machinery of the cells. That's nutrigenomic dosing. So for me, when I, based on the insanely high number of inflammatory variants that I had, I put myself on nine grams of fish oil a day for three months. Amazing. Okay? Wow. Not a single bruise on my body. Not one. Okay, my body just sucked it up. Okay. And my joint pain went away. 
Okay. Hmm. Which I, I'll spare you the details of my own health journey at the moment, but suffice to say, like I, the reason I dealt with such a hard population is that I went through my own 12 years of being chronically unwell and no one believing me. And, and by the way, it was all my fault, you know, mm. and, and that's, I developed the 10 pillars partly to save my own hide. And I went through that magic bullet therapy journey of trying to chase after the next shiny product personality protocol. That was me. And I realized, oh, it's not about chasing magic bullets. It's about everything working synergistically, identifying the priority pillars. So anti-inflammatory lifestyle, uh, anti-inflammatory diet, you know, one guy lost 20 kgs. That's about 40 pounds in one month. The other guy lost one kg a week for 16 weeks. Just by focusing on inflammation. Just focusing on the anti-inflammatory lifestyle, not, oh my, it's, it's, this isn't like the biggest loser is probably the most abusive shows on the planet. Oh, you know, it's you awful. It, it's awful. So hard to watch. Those people, yeah. those people who are walking bricks of fat, that's inflammatory weight. I mean, come on. Like it's like, yeah. Inflammation isn't going to come off on a treadmill that's on the oh, highest God. incline. Yeah. yeah. So Torture. that's an example of identify. And I picked, and I picked the nutrients based on their genes. Like these are the nutrients that are the most important based on your inflammatory gene variants that we're going to put you on higher doses than what the bottle says because one, you're under clinical supervision and it's genetically what you need and actually to change the gene expression to drop the inflammation, which is causing all of these things. And by the way, they're man boob strong also. Hmm. So because we cleaned up the inflammation that was building the fat and we got rid of the estrogen that was poisoning that was redistributing all that fat gain. And we did some things to help support their liver pathways as well to, to flush out the estrogen and so forth. Hmm. So that's pillar. We made the pillar three. We made it to three. Yeah. <laughs> hey, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Do, you, do you have like a top three anti-inflammatory supplements you use or is even that dependent on the genes? It's, it's dependent on the genes. And I would really um, not want to say what that is because okay. it's, it's not, and I'll tell you why, because first off, technology and information changes. The other thing is that um, there's going to be some nutritional trolls out there. It's like, oh my God, he didn't mention turmeric. How dare he? You know, and <laughs> right, right. It's like, <laughs> and, and then if I say turmeric, okay, which turmeric? Was it organic? Did they have bioprene in it as well? Was or do they actually have, you know, have they done functional testing to see do they have a food intolerance to turmeric? Like I do. I've I checked my yeah. food intolerance. I have antibodies to turmeric. So you know I what? do as well. Turmeric I'm with is you. Pro inflammatory for us. Yes. So yeah. it's yeah. it's you can this is where functional testing is so important. And, and ultimately, if you people really want to accelerate their biohacking, then they gotta work with a professional who actually does functional testing and has a paradigm to explain and analyze and more importantly help you implement a synergistic model of all the multiple variants that affect your physiology. For me, it's the 10 pillars of health, the model that I put together working with seriously, really, really sick people and getting them better and realizing, oh, it's the same thing for biohackers also. So if you have a, a lifestyle model like the 10 pillars of health, and then you have functional testing, whether it's for adrenal glands or gut and parasites, thyroid, mitochondria, like the ion panel from Genova, or like actually, I'm a speaker on the mitochondrial summit that's happening in December, and I was I, my talk was how to do lab analysis for for your mitochondria. So that was that was my little cool. piece too. Oh, great! I love I love analyzing mitochondria. So and if you anything's you know anything you know you know your audience obviously they're into biohacking. Like the mitochondria is like the thing at the moment. So, yes. Yeah. But you can lab test for that. Like that that you can do that now. So and then or, so you've got someone who can analyze all the lifestyle. And also verify broken biochemistry with functional testing, then you actually have the fast track to biohacking. So that's that's something that people should look for. Does the person, does their health coach or clinician, do they actually have a framework to assess? You know, me, it's the 10 pillars of health. May someone may have the dodecahedron of wellness or the inverted rhombus of you know your gut. Who cares? Just they must have a model that that works. So 10 pillars, first one was uh, brain and hormone system, which we kind of skipped to the bowel and digestion, which is the second pillar. First one is brain in the middle. That's, that's brain and hormone system. So that's, that's adrenals, that's thyroid, that's estrogens, uh, neuroplasticity. Second pillar was bowel and digestion. Third pillar is body injuries and genetics. Fourth pillar is burst exercise and movement. That's the exercise pillar uh, for people who want 
to know more about my thoughts on the subject. Uh, I have an article on my website called Why Marathoners Look Like Cancer Patients. <laughs> it's diplomatically titled. Great I title. know. I love that. We'll yeah. definitely link that one. So, yes. I'm, I'm in that camp with you. Right, right. Fifth pillar is biotoxins, and that's you know huge and getting worse by the day. So that's everything that's toxic. It can be stuff in your food. It could be the food itself, the food intolerances. It can be off-gassing of carpets, walls, paint, and so forth. It's the petrochemicals, solvents, insecticides, pesticides. It's heavy metals. Uh, Whatever you can imagine that that shouldn't be in your physiology, that's the fifth pillar. And, and by the way, the worst thing people can do is run out and do a detox. Don't do that. Don't don't yeah. no, don't, don't do that. You can hurt yourself. I hurt myself. Okay. Best thing to do is remove overt exposure and work on the other nine pillars till you're strong enough to actually do a supervised detox. Okay. Yeah. Six pillars: bionutrients, which is all of nutrition, everything you put in your body that your body needs to metabolize: vitamins, minerals, essential fatty acids, single lipids glyconutrients, and I put oxygen and sunlight in there as well. Seventh pillar is breakfast, which is really a bookmark for habits and routines. So my first ebook was on breakfast, and that's the fastest way that I found people can start to feel better was to change their breakfast. And But really, I really it was about routines and habits, uh, especially some of the sickest people I ever worked with were shift work nurses because they're their schedule. Yeah. Breaking the circadian rhythm. Oh yeah. I have found the same thing. They're, they are some of the sickest people. Absolutely. And for multiple reasons, like you can go around all 10 pillars and just Mm -hmm. tick the box of every single one, but the one difference between them, shift work nurses and other really super overwhelmed all populations is that their, their circadian rhythm is screwed is it is all over the place. This human Tetris of scheduling that they play with nurses is dangerous, not only for them, but it, it kills patients because they make mistakes when you're tired. You do. Yeah. And you're, and you're stressed yeah. and you're coping. It's so awful. So that's there needs to be a change. Pillar. Yeah. Breakfast. I, I'm really, I, I, my, I wrote a napping article on my blog, like how to nap. I wrote that for my nursing patients because I needed to, they, they didn't know how to nap properly. So they, hmm. you know, people don't you know, die. And they, it's, but I realized that that napping article is good for most people. Uh, Sure. The eighth pillar is bothers and stress. So bother, I, just, I look, everything begins with the B in my model. So I, instead of stress. Is it just I, for ease? Just correct. to remember? Yeah. Correct. And I have an infographic, like if people want my- um, I will certainly uh, send it out. Yeah, yeah. If, if people want, yeah. if people who are listening, like they, they can get a copy of my ebook that actually has all of this explained, has the visual 10 pillars, explains them all, explains functional testing. Great. Uh, for people who are listening, don't text and drive, but- you can text biohacker to double three triple four and just put in your email address and you'll get my ebook sent to you automatically. So you just literally text biohacker, all one word. It may, the spell check may split the word. Don't let it. It's biohacker, one word yeah. to double three triple four and you'll get my uh, ebook on how to biohack your biohacking. So you'll get the model in there. So that the eighth pillar is bothers and stress. So that could be Emotional stress, financial stress, religious stress, social stress, spiritual stress, family stress, work stress, clutter, Marie Kondo with her, you know, spark joy, you know, yeah. changing magic is trying to get up. Like that's why she's killing it in the world. Like clutter is a stress. Uh, watching the news is one of the most common things I do with people to get them de-stressed. It's like, stop watching the news. Just stop. Um, the ninth pillar is bugs hidden infections, parasites, and mold. It's not with bowel. I know people already think that, well, why don't you put it in the bowel things? Because mold ain't in the bowel. Hmm. It's, it's, it's your relationship with everything microscopic is in pillar number nine. Obviously, these pillars cross talk to each other, obviously. But I made bugs a separate thing because of the horrific mold issue in New Zealand, as well as across most parts of the world. Okay, hmm. like, So that's why it's a separate thing. Pillar number nine is bugs. And the 10th pillar is bedtime or sleep. Duration, quality, consistency, depth of sleep. So those are the 10 pillars, brain, bowel, body, burst, biotoxins, bionutrients, breakfast, bothers, bugs, bedtime. 10 pillars, pretty much covers everything. And yeah, it's a pretty holistic approach. Yeah. And what we find is that people who are chronically unwell, they have a minimum seven out of 10 pillars crumbling. Uh, four of them can be sledgehammered. Uh, so the four that can be sledgehammers, one, the body pillar, where you get a massive car accident or at the wrong end of violence, or it's a sports injury, uh, that, I can just kaboom, you know, just 
just totally, your, that pillow can be gone from 90% to 20% like that. So quickly. The other one is biotoxins. You, you get exposed to a wicked toxin that's really in a sufficient amount very quickly. That can take you down fast. The other thing is the uh, bother's pillar, like someone close to you dies suddenly, or you found out someone's been having an affair, or whatever it is, someone's messing with one of your members of your family, like, or, or whatever it is, like that can change your world on a dime. And the fourth pillar that can be sledgehammer is the bugs infection. You get a wicked food poisoning. You know, I've seen this so many times in practice. People go to India or Fiji or whatever, and they get a really bad food poisoning and they are down for the count. So that's the 10 pillars. And each pillar has, of course, its own personality and nuance, but those can all be assessed. And so when I work with people, they fill out a secure online survey that is each pillar, it, you know, has all the questions per pillar and then they go to the next section, which is the next pillar. So you actually learn about the pillars as you go through it. And what it does is I can efficiently, when I look at the surveys, I can look at which pillars are crumbling, why, when, and how, and then prioritize them to figure out which ones are going to, you should do that are the easiest to win that will give you the results, the fastest to have you start feeling better as quickly as possible. Then from that 10 pillar analysis, you can also identify which functional tests you actually need to run to confirm what biochemistry has been broken to then- Other than spending you- thousands of dollars on all of them and Correct. not knowing where yeah. to start, right? Correct. That was going to be my next question. So. Correct. <laughs> so you, from the lifestyle, past and present, as well as their health goals and their current situation, you then pick what's the fewest number of tests that's like biohacking. Like what's the fewest number of tests to run that will give the most meaningful amount of data that you actually can implement, that, you could, that the information you couldn't get from uh, history and survey and dialogue alone. That's the purpose of functional testing is, 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 is to further drill down and to give them a customized diet and nutrition. And you can give a cust- you know, people, what's the best supplement? Get tested. Don't don't get, get testing to figure it out. Don't, don't just because don't scroll through popular. Amazon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> so we made it. We did the 10 pillars. Amazing. Yeah. So we obviously could talk for a few more hours. We do have to start wrapping it up. Uh-huh. We will definitely link to all of these resources, including your book and the 10 pillars. Mm-hmm. I think what we want to know before we close out is if someone can't come see you, well, one can, do you do telehealth? Are people all I do is teleconsults at this point. So I don't where anyone people across are the in country. The world, it doesn't it doesn't matter. I do health in the world all, all around. I also Incredible. have on my website like so working with someone with telehealth like that's a real that that's a real investment of time, money, energy, and focus. Okay, for people that are you know not in a place to prioritize their personal resources of time, money, energy, and or focus, I have lots of videos on YouTube. I have a do it yourself kind of 10 pillars of health online course. It's not, it, it's just a bunch of videos of me going through in detail each of the 10 pillars, but it's, it's not the same as me personally going through your personal 10 pillars, as well as recommending specific lifestyle coaching, uh, specific functional testing to then determine what your personalized nutrition and diet plan and supplement plan should actually be. So my feeling is that I, I work with not a lot of people because I really focus on those people, but my main efforts are to teach broadly. So if I work with a few number of people and really help them and they, they really invest everything into that, that gives me the time, energy, and resources to then scale my educational efforts, which is why I've got like 60 plus videos on YouTube. I'm on all sorts of podcasts like this. I've been on multiple summits. Like to me, uh, unfortunately, by my observation is that my, my first tagline of my website, first of all, is how to MacGyver your health. Because in New Zealand, there's not much, you know, you've got to work with what you got. There's not a lot there. So what's the things that don't really cost anything to help your health? So my, but I also understand that functional medicine is still at this point in time, and it's shifting with, you know, the help of other luminaries in the field. It's still kind of a bourgeoisie practice. Like it's usually it's private pay and all this other stuff. And that's not, 
it, that's just the reality of the medical system as it is. Like insurance doesn't reimburse the level that it's needed to help with this type of care. So my way of dealing with this ethically is that I work with a few number of clients that really invest a lot into it. And then that I give hundreds of hours of content for free uh, online and write, write books that are super cheap, you know, like a dollar to $10, maybe a little bit more. And then like online courses and things like that. So you can scale out to help everybody. So that's, this is the phase that functional medicine is in right now. And it's just the way it is. And that's how I address the imbalance of access to biohacking and functional medicine as a whole. And I feel like that's the best approach that I can do to scale this content. And doing podcasts like this is, of course, part of that effort. Yeah, there's so much yeah. content and education. It's amazing. Yeah, and I just want to thank you for doing that. I know that takes a lot of time and work, but you are helping so many more people because I know a lot of people can't afford to work one-on-one. So, mm-hmm. so thank you for that. So before we wrap up, we have one more question for you. Mm-hmm. If you could give our listeners one tip to do starting today, what would that be? <laughs> so uh, I'll give you, I'll give you uh, a big picture answer and a small picture answer. Perfect. Okay. The, the big picture answer is, and it's going to sound self-serving. That's fine. I, I don't mind. Uh, get, get my ebook and learn about the 10 pillars so that then you can find out for yourself what is the one thing you need to focus on that based on the pillar that is crumbling the most. And so you can, you can get it through the resources in the podcast, or you can text biohacker, all one word to double three, triple four, and put in your email when the text comes back to you. Then on the micro level, the number one thing that I saw in clinical practice, and Nelson currently in coach health coaching, to help people feel better is to eat a real breakfast. And I know that may offend the sensibilities of multiple quote, you know, people who are biohacking and all into like, but I skip breakfast because it's going to help my ketones. Okay, great. (laughs) That's wonderful. Um, (laughs) Here's, here's the deal. Okay. So here's the deal. I'm all in favor of intermittent fasting, but I'm in favor of skipping dinner. Okay. Hmm. Because when you wake up, your cortisol levels are the highest. And if you don't eat something, then your cortisol level still goes up, up, and up. This is especially damaging to women. Now, I, 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 I know about Dave Asprey. I've met him a bunch of times. I've chatted with him. Okay, he also says like women shouldn't skip breakfast. Okay, there are. I also, I personally don't think that men should skip breakfast either. I think if they want to skip something, they should skip dinner. I think the most, and if you eat breakfast, it's break the fast. That's what it comes down to. What are you breaking the fast of? Your cortisol levels go up at night because you don't eat at night and cortisol tells the liver to break up glycogen to release fuel to the brain. So your brain has fuel to live because if you don't have enough fuel to your brain for not long enough period of time, that's called a stroke. Okay. That's what that's called. So your body does everything to make sure that it still has fuel to the brain, including screaming at the adrenals to keep releasing more and more and more and more cortisol to make sure your liver and then eventually your muscles break down to keep fuel going to the brain. So I'm all in favor of keeping those adrenals calm. And best way to do that is to actually have something meaningful for breakfast. Sorry out there, intermittent fasters, but as a clinician, you gotta- (laughs) Yeah, you've seen it, you've tested it. We appreciate that information a lot. Yeah, Yeah. makes sense, definitely. Yeah. And thank you for sharing the the ebook and the 10 pillars. It's not self-serving at all. It is your service to educate the people and you're doing it. And we're yeah. so grateful for that. So thank you. Thank you. It's, it's been I, really fun to talk with you too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I could ask a million more questions. I really have appreciated your time. This is awesome. Yeah. We'll, well just say, will you please come back on the show again? Of course. <laughs> we'll continue <laughs> so the conversation. A for a fellow burner, anything, right? Uh, I love it. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. All right. Thank you so much for tuning in. And we will definitely link all of these amazing resources for you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shea, for joining us. Thank you both. Yeah. I'll see see you next time. time. Love this episode of the Biohacker Babes podcast? Head over to Apple Podcasts to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. We truly appreciate your support. Until then, happy biohacking.